I'm going to start out with a very kind of existential question. Uh, why? Well, why do we exist? Uh, well, it's, uh, the book doesn't cover that, of course, but as you know, it does uh, cover a lot of whys, and a lot of them may seem existential to you. For example, why will Amazon open brick and mortar stores? Why uh, must all of e-commerce become experiential versus just convenience and price driven? Why is the wholesale, wholesale retail uh, business model collapsing into vertically controlled distribution from creator to consumer? Why is P&G rolling out Tide dry cleaning stores and Mr. Clean Car Washes? Why will 80 to 90 percent of traditional wholesale brands' revenues ultimately be generated through their own branded retail stores? You can argue the number, but that's significant. And also, therefore, conversely, why will 80 to 90 percent of traditional retailers' offerings be of their own private and or exclusive brands? Why will department stores roll out private branded specialty chains? This is spurring some provocative thought. Why are the smaller store strategies of Walmart, Target, you guys, and a lot of other retailers, most of them as a matter of fact, why are they accelerating? Why will the small independents and branded specialty chains grow faster and gain greater share than all other channels? Uh, which they have for many of the past many years. Uh, why are pop-ups now a preemptive distribution strategy versus a marketing tool? Why will department stores become enclosed mini malls, leasing space to brands and including competitors at some point and allowing them to run their own branded stores? Why? <laughs> Why will 50% of all brands and retailers who fail to do any one or all of the above, uh, why will they disappear? Uh, why indeed? Well, the, the, the answers to all of these whys and many more in the book are defining the new rules of retail, okay? Primarily being driven by a consumer with power beyond precedent in economic history, now converging with uh, technology and globalization, uh, and the, the, so these whys, which are actually predictions and more in the book, are actually happening because these dynamics are forcing businesses to transform their business strategies and therefore their business models to execute those strategies. Okay, where did we start? Well, not really, although that long journey <laughs> kind of felt like this at some point. Uh, actually, we started where we should at the very early roots of retailing, which you guys have read. Um, we defined the three waves of retailing during which we tracked the evolution of retailing along with consumers uh, on a parallel track. Uh, and perhaps the biggest event that occurred during this period was the enormous power shift from producers to consumers. Now, as you know, driving 70% of our GDP, and at the very least, driving the new rules of retail. Wave one. Uh, this was a period of producer power, and therefore retail power as well. Simply, there was more demand than there was supply. Uh, too few producer stores and stuff. Uh, in fact, uh, the, the, that along with the fact that there was a very um, insignificant, inefficient distribution infrastructure, uh, very few roads, transportation. So the 60% of the population that lived in the rural areas, for them, uh, the Sears catalog was a big deal. I mean, these families would sit in their homes waiting for those 100 pages of catalogs, uh, and the whole family would sit in the living room and order whatever they needed from the cradle they were rocked into the coffin they were uh, buried in. Seriously, you could buy your home through that catalog. Uh, as you know, J.C. Penney came on a little later in early 1900s. Uh, this was also the uh, era of the launching of department stores, late 1800s. And, but they were just in big cities. Uh, but they were called palaces of consumption. Why? because those rural families would travel hours 
to get into those cities, and then they'd have an all-day outing at those department stores. Is there a little irony here, guys? <laughs> Is this a back-to-the-future moment, uh, focusing on consumers? Except today, the experience has to be so great that uh, you're not going to be pulling people in off the farms. You've got to pull people away from the Internet. <laughs> so anyway, with a growing population of people who needed stuff, because we couldn't make enough and distribute it fast enough to serve those needs, uh, consumers had to accept pretty much what they could get. Henry, Henry Ford at the time was saying, you can have whatever Model T you want as long as it's black. Uh, so the point is, producers and retailers had the power with very little competition. It meant put a decent price on a product and make a decent profit. Then ramping up to, um, I missed the pictures of department stores, uh, some of the early ones. Ramping up to wave two, of course, uh, there was expansion of Sears pennies on the department stores, moving into the now growing cities and small towns across this country. Oh, by the way, what few brands there were in wave one were single product brands like Levi jeans. All right, wave two uh, called this period the uh, uh, capitalism unbounded. Explosive growth on the supply side, both transportation and communications, the big distribution infrastructure. In fact, we built 46,000 miles of interstate highway system during that period. Ergo, uh, the enormous construction that gave mobility, so the population began to move into the uh, burbs and the cities, and ergo, the construction of regional malls and shopping centers across the country. And that, of course, spawned a huge expansion of you guys, Sears, and the department stores to anchor those malls. Uh, in the 60s, Kmart, Target, and Walmart were launched. This was also the period that ignited the apparel specialty chains, the Gaps, Esprits, and hundreds of others. Um, and of course, today, there's something like over 30%, number one share of all apparel is sold through that uh, business model. I may have the numbers wrong, David, but it's somewhere in there. And of course, the department stores had that share uh, back then. Later on in wave two, the big boxers came on, Home Depot, Bed Bath & Beyond, and so forth. Uh, so more and more competitors, more and more stores and stuff in them. Then as population growth and demand started to sl slow, supply did not. At one second in the middle of the last century, supply shot past demand and never looked back. And it all accelerated after World War II. So with more and more stuff than people needed, consumer was getting more power of choice, so their expectations were going up and they can now say, you can't just build it and expect me to come to you. You have to give me a compelling reason to come to your store and buy your products. Thus, we shifted from a production-driven economy and um, industry to a marketing-driven economy and industry. And now, with the greatest in distribution infrastructure in the world, it was also the birth of big media, television, national magazines, uh, appropriately, it was called mass markets at the time and mass marketing to serve those markets. It was also the, um, that's when the Mad Men were born. It was called the golden age of advertising. Literally thousands of uh, new national brands were launched and marketed heavily. Um, and, and, and this was a phenomenal, just a phenomenal uh, growth period. So, and what, therefore, <laughs> we had to figure out how to create demand to compel those people into the store to buy our stuff. Uh, so that's what spawned all of this. And as these national brands had to elevate their demand creation uh, to compel consumers away from the now growing competition. So we shifted from single product brands like Levi Jeans to lifestyle brands like Ralph Lauren, which is the very first lifestyle brand launched in the 60s. Okay, on to wave three, which we are now in. We identified three game-changing, uh, fundamentally disruptive events. One was the explosive growth coming out of wave two. 
converging with the advent of technology and the internet and globalization. Technology and globalization drove low-cost production, more effective and efficient distribution, enormous increase in productivity, and the great news we could make more for less. The bad news is we made way more than we needed, okay? So thus oversaturation, too many store stuff, and now websites. In a word, success begat excess. The good news, on the other hand, as you all know, the consumer today has the power of unlimited and instantaneous access right at their fingertips, a key tap away or a store across the street. So the power shift is now complete from producer to consumer, and the market characteristics and, and requirements are just ratcheted up, okay? It's no longer just a marketing driven, it's marketing and distribution driven. No longer uh, is creating demand enough. Uh, we've got to create and deliver to demand. Lifestyle brands used to win. Now it's going to be a lifestyle experience. Mass markets to finite markets and mass marketing to micro marketing. How much access do they have today? <laughs> Look at this line, and this is has didn't have a blip in the other recessions. There were three of them, I think, during this period. Straight up, retail space growing at four times that of population growth. Lazard Frere did an investment, uh, the investment bank did a study about 30 years ago that said we had twice as much re real estate, re retail space as demand warranted, but of course the building didn't stop. And to give this a little more color, today we have 20 square feet of space for a man, woman, and child in this country. And now you add to that the 55,000 square feet and under, smaller malls and shopping centers and independents, and that bar shoots up to 46 square feet per capita. And now I ask all of you very bright people, how do you translate the now some 5 billion websites into square feet? Think about it. Nobody, ha nobody has done that, and they don't know how to do it, and it can't be done. Uh, and as I've said, that, that these buildings aren't empty out there, so it means an enormous expansion of stuff as well, and this is just one product category anecdotally. Again, you may argue the numbers, but back in 1980, I think there were six major blue jean brands. Uh, today, they're over 800. So, consumer has power of total access, more and cheaper access through market saturation, globalization, increased productivity, quicker and easier access through rapid, more responsive, multi-distribution platforms, including the internet and mobile devices, and smarter access through increased information and communications. And just as an aside, information. The amount of information stored between 1999 and 2002 would have filled 37,000 libraries of Congress, and it has increased tenfold since then. So what is the sister of the power of total access? It would be power of total control. Consumer controls your business. Uh, you either give them what their heart desires, or they walk out your front door across the street into another store, tap into another website, accessing themselves to just one more of hundreds of other equally compelling products. So, <clears throat> to close the loop on just how powerful this consumer is in access, the whole dynamic of built and they will come with the store in the center, the consumer going to the store, has been flipped on its head. Consumer is now in the center of the store, must go to the consumer. And by the way, it isn't just electronically, okay? It is also physically. It is the small store strategies of the big guys and you guys. And that's not the only reason you're doing small stores, but it is a major reason. Getting, it is gaining greater access to the consumer and providing more convenient and easy access to you. 
okay? So the $64,000 question, of course, <clears throat> is how do retailers and brands get to those consumers first, faster, and more often than the hundreds of equally compelling competitors? And if and when they do, what does it take to open their pocketbooks? Well, we identified five major shifts, which you guys have read about. Um, the most powerful shift being from needing stuff in the last century to demanding experiences. Stuff today, even new stuff, doesn't do it anymore. It's just the price of entry. Uh, consumers today expect great and new product all the time, but now they're demanding experiences. The classic game changer, of course, was from Maxwell House in a can to Starbucks. It's from buying yoga wear off of a rack to Lululemon. It's uh, from buying a pair of pants off a shelf to the, the, the whole faux nightclub experience at Abercrombie and Fitch and on and on. Uh, and I'll revisit experiences in a minute. Conformity to customization, it's simply uh, from people needing to feel included in the last century a part of their peer group, the same brands, uh, to today consumers really want uh, exclusivity, special brands just for them, special fashions just for them. Um, it, it's from like, you know, Levi jeans, one for every behind in the last century, to 800 Blue G brands, one for each behind. It's the, it's the accelerated pursuit of all uh, retailers for private and or exclusive brands, uh, which you guys are a big part of. It's localization. It, ubiquity is antiquity today. You, you, you must view the consumer as a universe of one. From plutocracy to democracy, um, forget the language, it's, a, it's from this notion that only the wealthy own everything. Luxury to democracy, affordable luxury for all. You know the drill. It's Nicole Miller at J.C. Penney, Vera Wang at Coles, Massimo and, and Cynthia Rowley and so forth and so on at Target and on and on and on across the boards. And this will continue and accelerate. Um, from new to new and now, we live in a 24-7 world where whatever you create new today is going to be knocked off tomorrow morning. So you've got to knock yourselves off every day of the week. And you know what it spawned. It spawned fast fashion. Uh, it's Mango. It's uh, Zara, H&M. And that, too, uh, is accelerating. Uh, the last one is very important. It's almost a cultural shift. shift. Uh, it's from self to community, meaning it's from me, 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 more, 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 to a total reassessment of value and values. Uh, it, 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 less is becoming more. Quality is beginning to trump quantity. Uh, we're, we're forming these communities and networks where you have to be invited in, and then you will uh, converse among that community, with that community, as opposed to a customer you are talking at and wanting to sell something to. Um, and sustainability, I tell you, this is no longer just a fad. It's, it's a trend, and it's sticking. Okay, cut to the chase. Um, what new business strategies and business models to execute those strategies are we going to need to compete and succeed in wave three and into the future in what is essentially a share wars marketplace, okay? And you guys know what that means. It means that to grow your businesses, you've got to steal a customer away from a competitor or you've got to get your customer to buy more and more often from you. And uh, by the way, again, you may argue the numbers, but uh, it's uh, twice as costly, or thereabouts, to get a new customer than it is to get your customer to buy more from you, and your customer is something like three times as profitable. So think about that. Anyway, what we arrived at through all the analysis, research, and so forth, uh, big picture uh, told us that businesses had to excel in every aspect of their business or they're going to die, okay? But that is just the price of entry, just to achieve competitive parity. In other words, the meta metaphor is this. You may excel in all areas of your value chain. It may be enough to get you to the playoffs, okay? But only 
superiority wins championships. Yes, every company we talked to, every single one declared that they were consumer centric. Who wouldn't? Um, but the real winners were taking consumer knowledge to another superior level. Every one of them said they were elevating their experiences, but the real winners were taking experience to another superior level. And every one of them said, yeah, we're on all, multi -dist all distribution platforms, but the real winners were taking it to another superior level. In effect, the revelation, the tumblers fell in place. Um, we identified, as you know, three imperative strategic operating uh, principles that the winners were taking beyond excellence on, into another superior level. Uh, experiential superiority, distributional superiority, and superior control over one's value chain. And we said, not just an experience, a neurologically addictive experience. We actually tapped into leading edge research methodology, the neurosciences, which are about how the human mind reacts to <coughs> external events, environment, experiences. And what they're finding is that great experiences go way beyond just triggering an emotional response in humans uh, to actually connecting with the mind. And, and we define three times when this would happen, or is happening. First of all, it's a chemical dopamine, which when released in the human brain, causes feelings of euphoria, self-satisfaction, confidence, and, and eventually can read, lead to addiction. We said it happens three times. One, in anticipation of the experience. I mean, you can wake up in the morning and think about Starbucks. Starbucks and get your first surge. The experience itself could be the yoga class at Lululemon. And then a surge uh, when you're actually consuming the product or service. And it's not just coffee. It could be a cool <laughs> outfit by Ma MNG by Mango. Um, so, and the most important thing about experiences is that they're co-created. You put the experience out there, but when the consumer comes in, they shape that experience to the mood of the moment, the mood they are in. So each time they come back for that experience, it is unique and different because their attitudes and moods are changing. Think about that. So not only are you enticing them to come back and back and back, come addicted, um, it elevates the value of your entire store and everything in it. Read pricing power. Distributional superiority, in this context, distribution is preemptive access. And um, the real winners are understanding that consumers got hundreds of equally compelling products right at their fingertips. They have to figure out how to preemptively distribute their value to that consumer ahead of those hundred equally compelling products or services, which means they've got to operate on all distribution platforms, and it may be a distribution platform that you're not even thinking about. Um, it's, it, 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 it Selfridge is coming into J.C. Penney, okay? It's MNG and Mango being, that's another distribution platform for these guys. So we're not just talking about uh, the internet and a brick and mortar store. You can be moving your J.C. Penney brand around and to many other distribution plans. And they've got to be seamless and they've got to be integrated. And the biggest aha here, what would be the biggest preemptor of all? It's a neurologically uh, connected consumer, the, the dopamine addict, if you will. The Starbucks and Lululemon addicts will go two miles for their fix when there might be a yogurt or coffee shop uh, right across the street. So you build enough of an overwhelming experience and people are going to yank themselves away from their internet regardless of price. The third operating principle, without which the other two are rendered useless. Simply but profoundly transformational <coughs> is the bare fact you cannot achieve an addictive experience, or you cannot achieve the level of preemptive distribution necessary without controlling your value chain. And most importantly, the three most important parts of the value chain, 
One, right up front, when you are learning what your customer is dreaming for from you in terms of experiences, products, all your research, all that stuff. Control of that. Control of the creation, not only the experience, but all the products and services that go with it and all the marketing. And you must control that experience, including the dream, when it touches a consumer at point of sale.